Hello, I'm Alec Avdikov, and welcome to the life and times of Frederick the Great. It's great to be back on a weekly schedule again. I would like to remind you that I am donating half of my advertising money to help aid the Ukrainians as long as there is a war. I also have listener support at the bottom of my episode descriptions. There's a link to it there. Half of the money that is donated there will be going to Ukraine. You can either give monthly or one-time donations. Also, be sure to give me honest feedback and reviews wherever you're listening from. I appreciate hearing from you all. Now, let's get back to the business of Frederick the Great. The last time I spoke about Frederick, I discussed his sexuality back in February of this year. I talked about how Frederick would be classified as a homosexual by today's standards, but such a term was non-existent back in the 18th century. The influence of Frederick's sexuality on the affairs of Prussia has an impact that is still bitterly debated by historians today. As we are coming to the end of his reign, let us go way back to in discussing the impact Frederick's father had on overall political situation of Prussia. King Frederick Wilhelm, in domestic terms, modernized, expanded, and increased the efficiency of the Prussian bureaucracy. The idea of a Germany that is efficient starts with these reforms set by Frederick Wilhelm. He made the, serv the civil service a less exclusive institution. He allowed talented commoners, such as retired soldiers, to s enter state institutions. This led to public works such as the increase of public education, draining of swamps to free up land for agricultural use, and building of canals so that Prussia could be a more internally integrated state. Frederick Wilhelm was also extremely fiscally conservative. If something was deemed ostentatious in the slightest, Frederick Wilhelm would get rid of it. An example of this would be when Frederick Wilhelm basically fired the entire court from his father's reign, including that poor chocolatier. This also leads to King Frederick Wilhelm's idea of masculinity. He considered anything that did not have to do with practical ruling of a nation to be wrong, sinful even. He hated opera, the excesses of Baroque art, and the foppish fashion at the time. His idea of ruling was based entirely on the possible. Nothing idealistic was worth his time. This is one of the reasons why he despised young Frederick as a teenager. Frederick played the flute, loved French culture, and specifically of importance for today, philosophy. Frederick loved reading and writing about philosophy. He probably was one of the most well-read Hohenzollern who ever lived. This is why it was such a blow to Frederick after his escape plot was discovered when he was imprisoned and he could only read a short list of approved books by his father. These books were either religious in nature, which Frederick despised, or were about the practicalities of ruling the kingdom. Therefore, as time slowly marched on in Prussia and the rift between father and son began to heal, Frederick Wilhelm gave Frederick the Rheinsberg Palace. This was a place where Frederick could fulfill his princely obligation set by his father and meet his aspirations for music and philosophy. The palace was given to Frederick by his father back in 1733 in the first year of his marriage. His wife would then join him in Rheinsberg in 1736, and they would live there for four years together. Frederick began to read and write at a furious pace. He received one of the best classical educations in spite of his father. Rheinsberg had a sizable library, and according to David Fraser's book on Frederick the Great, it contained 4,000 volumes. These volumes were then copied twice so that Frederick could have a particular copy, whether at his palace in Potsdam, Sanssouci, or Charlottenburg when he became king. Frederick toured the entire kingdom in 1735 and continued to read about history, military history, philosophy, and politics. Today's episode will contain a great deal of philosophy and political science. After all, that is what Frederick's first book was about. Why should we care about what Frederick's book has to say? Good question, little Timmy. The title of Frederick's first, and in my opinion, most important book, is The Refutation of Machiavelli's Prince, or more commonly known as Anti-Machiavelli. Frederick writes about how wrong the literal reading of the prince is to society at large, but I am getting ahead of myself. 
Let us go back in time to the Renaissance in Florence, Italy. We see a little six-year-old child playing in the city square in 1475. This child will grow up to be known as one of the most reviled, power-hungry schemers of all time, Niccolo Machiavelli. However, as Machiavelli said in his most famous book, The Prince, everyone sees what you appear to be. Few experience what you really are. So, let us unpack what I mean by that. Niccolo Machiavelli was born in 1469 in Florence. Machiavelli would join the civil service of the Florentine Republic in the 1490s and become a senior diplomat in 1498. He would hold his post until 1512, when the Medicis, a famous and filthy rich family at the time, took back power in Florence. When the Medici family took the reins of power in Florence, they ended up torturing poor Machiavelli. He never pleaded guilty, so he was then exiled from the city to live in the countryside. While in exile, Niccolo Machiavelli wrote his most famous book, The Prince, as well as many others, such as The History of Florence and The Discourses of Livy. The Prince is full of practical political advice for people who are princes. Machiavelli's definition of a prince is essentially one who holds power singularly compared to a republic where power is more evenly distributed amongst his people. Famous quotes from the prince include, quote, If an injury has to be done to a man, it should be done so severe that his vengeance need not be feared. And, quote, Never attempt to win by force what can be won by deception. And, most famously, quote, it is much safer to be feared than love, because love is preserved by the link of obligation which, owing to the baseness of men, is broken at every opportunity for their advantage. But fear preserves you by a dread of punishment which never fails. It is this rational disgust that people have for deception, fear, and overwhelming force that causes the perception of Machiavelli to be a horrible schemer. It is also out of this natural reaction that Crown Prince Frederick begins to write his argument against the prince. However, this book should not be read as a standalone book. Remember one of the books that I listed as Machiavelli's work? It's perfectly alright if you don't. I'll remind you before the quiz. Nah, there's no quiz. Anyway, Niccolo Machiavelli also wrote Discourses on Livy. This is a much more comprehensive book on Machiavelli's views than the prince. He even writes a chapter titled, quote, a republic is more prudent, more stable, and of better judgment than a prince. In both books, he uses historical examples so that the mistakes of the past are not repeated. The prince, according to the modern view, is more of an expose of corrupt power than it is a love letter to corruption. So, is Machiavelli a proponent of the tyrants of the world, or, is he an opponent of lawlessness and a proponent of republics? I'll leave that question to you all. Anyway, it was this gut reaction against deception and poor princely virtues that young Frederick wrote his first book, Anti-Machiavel. As the crown prince of Prussia, Frederick begins to write a rebuttal against what Frederick believes is the handbook of terror and destruction. He begins by saying so in the foreword of this book. Frederick writes, quote, I have always regarded the prince as one of the most dangerous works which were spread in the world. It is a book which falls naturally into the hands of princes and of those who have a taste for policy. So obviously he's not too big of a fan of Machiavelli's work, believing that this book caused princes to be more tyrannical. In the first chapter of the Anti-Machiavel, Frederick writes something that I discussed way back in the third episode about the great elector. Frederick writes, quote, The sovereign, far from being the absolute master of the people which are under his domination, is only the first servant. This goes back to the traditional Hohenzollern neo-Stoicism that took root under Frederick's great-grandfather, the Great Elector. Side comment here, but I think the Great Elector deserves a lot more press than he does. If people don't really know who Frederick the Great was, then the Great Elector is completely alien to them. Yet, he ruled longer than any other Hohenzollern and was extremely successful if you consider the challenges he faced throughout his reign. 
Anyway, this line of thinking actually aligns fairly well with Frederick's father's views on how a sovereign should behave. This brings me to an interesting conclusion I've made. Frederick the Great and his father aren't as opposed politically as one would think at a glance. The main gripe that Frederick Wilhelm had about Frederick is that Frederick didn't fit the moral standards that were set by Frederick Wilhelm. Besides that, they were fairly similar as statesmen. Frederick and Frederick Wilhelm both believed in autocracy as the most efficient way to run a country, thus leading to the fact that they were both extreme control freaks. They both believed that the Habsburgs were mistreating Prussia. They both believed that better infrastructure and education unlocked the true potential of a state. And Frederick was even more socially conservative than his father was. This means that Frederick was not as willing as his father to allow commoners to climb the social ladder. All of this leads me to my conclusion, which is similar to the author Tim Blanning's opinion, that Frederick and his father were not so different as one would first think. Anyway, these were major parts of Frederick's geostrategic thinking, which is why I spent so much time on the similarities of policy between Frederick and his father. The neo-Stoic belief that the prince must be the man who serves his people with just laws will be a guiding principle that Frederick will continue to have for the rest of his life. If I know one thing about Frederick the Great after reading over 600 pages about him, it's that he hated chaos and lawlessness. Frederick continues to refute Machiavelli's work with Enlightenment ideals that the virtue of men should be the driving force of politics rather than backroom dealing, violent atrocities, and corruption. The next part of the book I find extremely intriguing. Frederick, in his final chapter, discusses what wars are deemed to be justified. He discusses a lot about diplomacy in this chapter. Frederick gives away a bit of his future ruling style when he writes, quote, one should not misuse the tricks and the smoothness. They are like handymen. Too frequent use of them blunts your own head and leaves you dependent on men who, at bottom, are motivated largely by self-regard. For the most part, Frederick will have a predictable foreign policy and ruling style. However, there will be two times during his reign when he turns this principle on its head and stuns all of Europe. One trick will actually take place within the first year of his reign. Now, we move on to the final section of this book. War. Frederick writes that he is not a war-mongering man when he writes, quote, War is always the last result. Thus, one should make use of it only with precaution and with a feeling of despair, and after a thorough examination as to whether one is carried away by an illusion of pride or by a reason that is solid and essential. Someone should have told Kaiser Wilhelm II this before he lit Europe on fire in 1914, but now nah, it happens. So Frederick notes three types of wars that are justifiable. Wars of defense, which are most justifiable, wars of interest, and wars of precaution. Wars of interest are, according to Frederick, quote, to uphold that rights that are being questioned. They plead their case with weapons in hand, and the engagements tend to decide the validity of their reasons. This is the second most justifiable war because it was in the interest of the people to have that war. And the final type of war he discusses is the war of precaution. This is such an interesting quote that I will read the entire paragraph. Frederick proposes, There are wars of precaution that princes are sometimes wise to undertake. They are offensive with regard to the truth, but they are not the less right. When the excessive size of a power seems close to overflowing and threatens to absorb the universe, it is prudence to throw sandbags at it and to stop the stormy course of a torrent while one is still master. One sees clouds which gather together a storm which is forming and the flashes which announce it, and the sovereign that this danger threatens will not be able to entreat the storm, will meet, if he is wise, the storm measure for measure. If the kings of Egypt, of Syria, of Macedon had banded together against the Roman power, they would still have never been able to upset these empires. But a wisely concerted alliance and a war quickly undertaken would have deflated Rome's ambitious designs to conquer the universe. Self-defense was the most 
that these powers could hope for. It is prudent to prefer the least evils to the greater, as to choose the trustworthy partner over that which is dubious. It is thus better to, that if a prince engages in an offensive war when he is the master, to choose deliberately between the branch of olives and that of the laurel, that he waits until a despairing point or that a declaration of an offensive war is the only thing between him and slavery and his ruin. It is an unquestioning maxim that it is better to prevent than be prevented. The great men are always good at spotting an imminent fight and responding by surgical use of their forces before their enemies implemented plans that would blind their hands and destroy their capacity to retaliate when war becomes open. Let me unpack this extremely crucial and long quote. Wars of precaution are offensive in truth, but defensive and therefore justifiable in principle. This is because a war that is precautionary is a preventative war. This is justified when great tyranny is directed against you and preventative violence is needed to overtake this tyranny. An example of this would be the Southern view of the American Civil War. They called it the War of Northern Aggression, despite the first shots being fired from Southern guns. Rich Southern plantation owners wanted to prevent the institution of slavery to be degraded and therefore attacked the North in a war of precaution. This admittedly is not the greatest example, but it gets the point across why Frederick believed that wars of precaution are just wars. This principle will lead him to, to two massive wars on the European continent and throughout the world. Right after Frederick takes the throne, there will be political machinations that will lead to Frederick to trick the great powers and start a war of precaution. Thus is the book Anti Machiavel, written by Frederick the Great. It would be first published in September of 1740. This was four months after Frederick the Great became king in Prussia. Overall, I think this book is absolutely essential if you want to understand the political philosophy behind young Frederick the Great. I have a link to the book in the episode description, and it's free to read, so no point in not reading it. As it was the work of an important Italian that the King Frederick the Great refuted, I believe I will conclude today's episode by saying grazie per il vostro tempo. Thank you for your time.